Social media. Most of us check Facebook throughout the day. Twitter is my go-to place to discuss politics with everyone from friends and colleagues to people I've never even met. Imagine if, in 140 characters or less, tweeting about the government could put you behind bars. This was one man's reality. He spent months in prison for doing just that. This man has been tortured, his children have been targeted, and he's been locked up in solitary confinement for putting his head above the crowd and speaking up for human rights in a country that wants you to believe it is open, prosperous and progressive. His name is Nabil Rajab and he is the leader of the human rights movement in Bahrain. If you have put me in jail, me and one or two of my colleagues in the early 2000, no human rights work would be in Bahrain. You stopped all human rights activism. But today you put me in jail. It's no problem because we have a movement today. With me or without me, the human rights work does continue. You're listening to In Their Own Words, a podcast series from Amnesty International, where human rights heroes tell their incredible stories for themselves. Here's Nabil. My name is Nabil Rajab, of course. I am uh, 51 years of age now. I have been an activist since I was in school. I have uh, six sisters and five brothers. I am I am married 19 years ago. I have uh, two children. Adam is my eldest son, who has just finished school and could not get admission to the university because I am his father. Originally, I am a businessman, and I used to work uh, and finance my human rights work from the beginning. Till uh, my business been destroyed by the government supporter four or five years ago. I'm not a businessman anymore. Bahrain categorized as one of the worst countries when it comes to the level of freedom of expression. I have spent uh, 30 months in jail in the past uh, four years due to the, my activism and human rights, due to the work I do, due to the tweet that I make criticize the human rights situation. So it's very difficult. And you can't uh, criticize the ruling family. It's just considered to be a crime here. A tweet, when a tweet criticizing ISIS have uh, sentenced me for six months in jail. So there is no room for uh, criticism here. It's a very dangerous situation, very repressive environment that uh, have made the majority of activists to go and work in hiding. I was in uh, nine standard, 13, 14 years of age. When my teacher were arrested while we were in the class, masked man, they came and pulled him from the class. I feel something wrong is happening and nobody wants to speak about it. A few months later, a kid, a friend of mine, my age at that time, they came to arrest him in the first day of the exam. Mask security people came inside the school to arrest a, a young kid for just taking part in a protest. And the guy was so afraid, he jumped from the window, second floor, and broke his legs and he ran and they catch him later. They sentenced him for six months. So these two incidents made me open my mind and I always wanted to shout at that time, wanted to say something, but I can't speak. Not because of fear, because nobody wants to listen to me at that time. I was not a known person. Nobody knows me who I am. So what I have done in those days, I have gone and take some spray paint and start writing about human rights in the wall of my school. Away from it, right or wrong, I have done it. So I've been caught and I was kicked out of from the school. Then I have to go to another school and dig again created my own group of activists and we were young 
those years the human right considered to be a crime in Bahrain talking about a human right then I have gone to India and I spent five years in India finished my school and university there and I was a lot attached to the Indians there were a better environment to discuss issue of concern human right and justice Indian democracy and why don't we have the same thing so I came late 80s back to Bahrain become activist started to build a relation with international human rights group start to make our own uh, human rights group in secrecy because it is not allowed at that time human rights group it's like you committing a crime 2001 2002 we are allowed to work openly for a few years so I started the first registered human rights group which is the Bahrain Society for Human Rights at the beginning, my parents uh, were afraid of the work that I do, especially I come from a loyalist family, very loyalist family. So it was not a, uh, something that uh, they were aware of, so they were afraid, especially seeing uh, me being criticized in the newspaper. In 2006, I was uh, admitted to hospital for uh, two weeks after being attacked by the police. And I still have injuries in my back, which gonna stay with me forever. And it's not the first time. There are many times I was attacked in the front of my family. People like me who spend time in Europe and America, who have tested democracy and the level of justice they have, I want my country to experience the same situation. Personally, I'm happy because I have seen how my society have been developed. I have seen how much uh, human right awareness does exist today, which did not exist 10 years ago, but it does exist today. How much people are using social media to promote human right today. It did not exist many years ago. 2011 is shaping up to be an historic year in the Middle East and North Africa with the populist uprisings in Tunisia, then Egypt, and the massive street protests that are occurring across the region. Libya, Bahrain, Iran are the latest countries to be hit by a wave of popular protest. It was a turning point. It was a turning point. People of Bahrain, after 14 of February, it's different than people of Bahrain before. 14 February, 2011 there was a Facebook call people are asked to come out in the street protesting fighting for justice fighting for equality nobody knows till this moment who is behind that Facebook page but maybe I was one of the first people who gave that call legitimacy because maybe I have said that publicly I am with that call and I'm gonna be out in the street Every village said that we're going to go to the nearest uh, highway and we'll protest. There was no one major protest. And I said, I'm going to go out from my house, walking to the highway at uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So I came out from my house and there were hundreds of people waiting outside my house to walk with me. So we walk. This hundreds of people become thousands of people once we reach the highway. Government were shocked and suddenly they see wide scale protest all over Bahrain and they have no control about it. My demand was a respect for human rights, applying justice, respecting equality, creating laws that respect the human rights. Other people want to change the government, other people want to change the regime. I did not believe that I would see three quarters of the population taking part in protest in a population of 600,000 people. This is something you haven't witnessed in the history of this mankind. Men next to the woman, religious next to the non-religious, leftist with the Islamist, with the secular, all together have one demand, justice, human rights. For the first time, you see the whole nation united in one aim, is to change. We want change in our society, we want change in our government, we want to see a better future for our children. The guy who called for 14th of February, he said, let's make the Pearl Roundabout a symbol, and we should all head there. 
It was like a joke when he said that because it is in the biggest highway we have in Bahrain. I myself did not take that seriously. I myself did not think that was a achievable matter. We want your freedom. We want a, a true parliament. A true parliament. We are a peaceful people. We came here to our right. They're chanting down, down with the regime. The same chant that we heard in Egypt. They're calling this a revolution, and they say it won't stop until they're listened to. I have just re realized people start walking all in one side, going to Peranda. But I said, this is something crazy. That will not happen. And I just realized people are walking towards the Peranda boat, and I'm walking with them. Till we reached the Pirana boat and we occupied the Pirana boat when we stood and put our tent and it did continue for a few days. Uh, there are many people who stayed the night uh, in the roundabout and uh, they are asking for their rights. Some of these demonstrators are calling for the king to be toppled. Others are talking about a constitutional monarchy. But their very first demand was the right to march here peacefully without being shot. And for now, they seem to have got it. How long are you going to stay? We will not move from here. We will not move from here. Is we don't have no stone. We don't have no guns. We don't have no knife. We have only this onion to smell when they give up bombers with the gas. Tear gas. Yes. We went there together, everybody, men and women, all together. Slowly, slowly, we start bringing our tent, restaurant, uh, people uh, dis distributing juice and water, the people call us, and, uh, and it's become like a center, like a downtown, where people go and buy and eat and all that. It's become a center, even the tourists used to come there and to see what's happening. It's something which we didn't witness before. So it is... Uh, a one week of honeymoon we have, enjoying, talking about democracy, seminar here and there, tent for the lawyers, there doctors, here the nurses, here human rights activists. I have my own tent for a human rights activist, talking about human rights and all that, documenting things. Thinking that government will listen to our demand. We didn't know that a discussion going on at that time to bring the Saudi army to take part on the crackdown. It is a, a, a nightmare. It is a black spot in our uh, government history that people will never forget. It's a beginning of a, a misery we still that still exists, and we're still uh, paying high price for it. They came early morning, around five o'clock, and they have attacked the bear roundabout. I was not there. The same moment they have occupied the bear roundabout, they have stopped my telephone. They have stopped my internet, they have stopped all my communication. And uh, I just heard from people that appear around about, and I wanted to go out, and I saw the army a couple of kilometers from my home. And the moment I went with a friend, they fired us with uh, live ammunition. And my friends were shot in the legs. Few shots have missed me. I was not hurt, but uh, many colleagues of mine were hurt. But thanks God, none of them were killed. Well, we don't know, I mean, exactly who are those people, but we know the police were deployed, the army, and we know the Saudi army were there. Hundreds of houses been raided, I said, robbed. Millions and millions and millions were robbed from houses. Gold, watches, wealthy material, and nobody opened an investigation. And you can't op say that. If I say that, I will go back to jail. Well, at that time, the only place you can get the 
uh, proper information in what's happening or was the hospital the doctors and the nurses will tell you how much people were killed how much people were wounded but then the hospital were targeted were taken by the army and doctors were tortured nurses were tortured wounded people were tortured what happened in the hospital was nightmare that will be in our history the number one hospital have changed to a torture center people are being treated by doctor but then the police will come at night and will torture the sick people the wounded people the people who were shot a hospital will happen in the hospital something very bloody and unforgettable over 40 50 people were killed by the end of 2011 but we still could maintain the peacefulness of the struggle. Then uh, 2012, we see some people start reacting violently by throwing Molotov cocktail and stones on the police. A way of a protest that I can't take part in it anymore because of the violent use by both sides. I do believe strongly in a peaceful struggle. I don't, I'm, I hate hatred. I was arrested in, in February 2011, tortured for a night, handcuffed, blindfolded, tortured, but they brought me back. I did not spend the whole night. And that was 21st of February. But then I was left alone till 2012, where I was arrested several times. Protests erupted in Bahrain on Thursday after a prominent human rights activist was arrested for the second time in a month. Nabil Rajab, the president of Bahrain's Center for Human Rights, was detained after criticizing the Bahraini monarchy in Twitter messages and in media appearances. Rajab had only been out of jail for a few days after spending the previous three weeks behind bars. Thursday's protests ended with Bahraini forces firing tear gas to disperse the crowds. They want to keep me away from people. And they found this is the best way to arrest him under the charges, insulting the Ministry of Interior because I said, stop torture. Of course, that is the direct uh, reason for arresting me, but it's not the real one. In fact, it's my activism, my talk, awareness I try to uh, create among uh, my society. And this is what they say is dangerous. They thought maybe I was one of the symbol of those protests. And they seen me being out free as they, there is no way they can't stop this protest. So they want to distance me. That's why they sentenced me for three months in July. But then while I was inside, I was sentenced again for another case for three years. The State Department is calling on the Kingdom of Bahrain to vacate charges against a prominent human rights activist who's just been sentenced to three years in prison. Nabil Rajab was detained in June after criticizing the U.S.-backed Bahraini regime in Twitter messages and in media appearances. He was sentenced to three years this week in what Amnesty International called, quote, the end of the facade of reform in Bahrain. Well, I had a difficult life inside the prison. I have a difficult uh, time inside the prison because uh, I was dis distanced from the Bahrainis, from my colleagues. All the prisoners, the thousands of them, kept together in the same buildings. Except me, they opened a new building when I was arrested and I was kept alone. But then they have brought some people with me who don't speak uh, my language mostly charged with the prostitution. So I spent uh, my two years with uh, two to three people whom I cannot speak their language. Chinese, Filipinos, Thai people. None of the political prisoners were kept with me. None of those people whom I know. So for two years, I did not speak about human rights. I didn't speak in English. Through my years, I have spent in jail. I was the only one among 4,000 prisoners to be kept alone, to be separated from all the other prisoners because they were afraid of the awareness I create. Wherever I go, I create awareness. I create organization. I create groups. 
people to work on human rights. The idea was to destroy my mind uh, stability and to keep me under uh, pressure so I lose my mind, but I was so strong. I was also empowering even those people who were with me, teaching them, spending my time and helping them, writing letters for them in English to do wherever they want in Bahrain. So I try to get use of every moment that I have. Well, I was uh, kept separately, of course, for two years, total disconnection from the outside world, not allowed to speak in the telephone, only certain words, I have to say, hello, how are you, fine. Not to ask about any political situation outside jail, or it will be disconnected, and I will be taken to solitary confinement. Forced to be naked and do some kind of exercise that have damaged my back and led me to hospital and uh, that has been happened several times but in general I was treated better than the others because they knew my connection with human rights groups I was not raped like my uncle who's 70 years of age today in jail he was raped I was not beaten like Abdul Hadi al my colleague, a human rights defender, he was beaten. He has 36 screws in his face. I was not beaten like him. I was not sexually harassed like all of them were sexually harassed. I was not electrocuted like everybody were electrocuted. So in that sense, I was treated better than them. So there with the international community helped me because being known by a lot of human rights groups like Amnesty International, I was not really tortured like the others. Physically, I mean, of course, psychological torture I, I did face. Well, it was difficult seeing your children growing up when you are inside jail. Every visit you see them becoming bigger and bigger. This is the time where they needed me to be with them. This is the teenage time where you need to be close to your children. And I was away from them. I lost my mom who wanted crying to see me before she died and uh, for many days she asked to see me and they would not allow me although the law says that if she if somebody died from your close family they give you three days to stay with the family I was not giving that chance that makes me angry I love my mom so much she paid high price but at the same time, the good thing, a lot of people stood with them, my family, my brother, my sister, my friends. They did not uh, let them feel alone. Seeing their father being supported by a lot of friends, international community, human rights groups who used to call them, like Amnesty International staff used to call them to check how they're doing and all that. So that supported them, make them feel strong, and also made me feel that I'm not alone, and my family were not alone while I was in jail. Knowing that you have something outside, you have a mission, you have not completed it. You have a nation that is waiting for you. You have a, a story to be completed. Thinking of those needs of the others and the mission need to be completed makes you feel strong. I remember that all the time and everybody standing with you, international communities supporting you, Amnesty International making campaign for you. All this very important, maybe those activists who take part in such activism, they don't know how much that has influence, how much that have an impact on the prisoners and his family. Knowing that you are not alone, people do believe in your struggle and are standing in solidarity with you but i'm telling you from an experience point of view it has changed a lot my life and my family life and make made us look at things more positively
at that night when I was released, I did not sleep the whole night. And I was waiting for the moment to hug my children and my wife. And uh, normally they wake you up at six o'clock in the morning to be released. This is the way they towards. But they did not come at me at six o'clock. And I thought that those people have decided not to release me for a reason or another one. But at one o'clock they came and said that, okay, now the order has come and police officer came to release you. Still remember that moment. So happy waiting for that moment to meet my family, meet my children, meet my people. And then I was released at like seven o'clock in the evening. And then I came out from the police station, my two children, my sister and brother were there. That was the happiest moment. Of course, my son and daughter, the moment they saw me coming from the jail, they start crying. It's the first time they cry in front of me. They did not cry while I was in jail. They did not cry while I was in, when they arrested me. But they cried. The first time they showed their feelings, real feelings, when I was released. They all cried. They could not believe it that I'm out. Of course, the first moment uh, before seeing my other brother, before seeing my uh, family, I went to visit my uh, mom graveyard uh, that first thing from the police station I asked my uh, brother to take me to see and to pray on her graveyard at least thing which I could not do when she was alive so I went to see my mom and uh, graveyard prayed spent a few minutes there then I went to see my family at home my brother could not drive the car because people were standing in front of the car. So I have to stand, step down and start walking. People kissing me here, people pulling here, people hugging me here. And imagine for two years, I was alone with one or two people and suddenly you are holded by hundreds of people pushing you this side, pushing you that side. Somebody want to take you up, somebody want to... And I told my family, I can't continue like this. Take me to the room. I want to just be alone. I'm afraid. I'm not used to this now. And something I have not witnessed for two years. So, of course, I went home just receiving people at home. Thousands of people uh, that night till two o'clock in the morning. Just keep kissing people, hugging people in and out. And didn't know that four months later I'll be arrested again. I thought that's it. But then again, four months later, I have been arrested again. You never know how do they do. Now, for example, they released me last July. But at the same day they released me, they put a travel ban on me. So I don't know how do they think. But I know they're serious about targeting me or silencing me. I could guarantee you that they will keep me, they will leave me alone if I keep quiet. But I know myself I will never keep quiet. I will keep speaking for those people, for those victims who cannot speak about themselves. I will keep speaking and I will keep empowering people to speak about themselves and to raise their issue of concern and expose this human rights violation at all levels. I'm going to continue doing that. Yeah, I do think twice and I reduce my writing now. When I do what I want to write, I let, uh, ask people, you do it. Now it's no room. So we do it in a way, it's not me who's going to do it. Yani. Other outsider people to do it. But this is temporary till we see where we are going to go. In general, I am under pressure not to say anything. I have one case against me with two charges. One charge is insulting the police because I asked them to stop torture in the Joe prison. So the total sentence could go uh, up to uh, 13 years. And I'm banned from traveling till we see where it's gonna go. So the work I have done was very tiring, it was very difficult, was very costly, but I believe in it. I believe in this value and I do know that everybody who dream for justice and dream for equality and dream for democracy has to be ready to
pay the cost and I am one of those guys who are ready to pay cost no matter how much that cost to achieve our goal. That was Nabil Rajab speaking to us from Bahrain. Nabil may not be in prison right now at the time of recording, but his freedom has been severely restricted as Bahraini authorities have placed him under a travel ban. And who knows when he will next be harassed or locked up for his activism. We'll continue to work closely with Nabil and other human rights activists like him, speaking out in a country that simply won't tolerate his calls for equality. And hopefully, one day, Nabil will be able to speak and move freely. I'm Anna Bacciarelli, and you've been listening to In Their Own Words, a podcast series from Amnesty International, produced by Sam Lawler. I'd like to thank Nabil for talking to us despite the risks. If you haven't yet checked out our other episodes, subscribe on iTunes or search for Amnesty Factual on SoundCloud to hear from journalist and former prisoner Peter Grester, Chinese dissident Chen Guanchang, and imprisoned whistleblower Chelsea Manning. A special thanks to Audio Network and Democracy Now! And thank you for listening.